Bravo Delta Show. Gorkha Tweed, the Himalayan answer to the Highland heritage. संयुक्त राज्य अमेरिका को अंतर्राष्ट्रीय विकास नियोग यूएसएआईडी नेपाल मा सन 1950 देखी सक्रिय छ। जसले नेपाली जनतालाई स्वास्थ्य, शिक्षा, लोकतंत्र र सुशासन, आर्थिक वृद्धि र मानवीय सहायता लगायत का विभिन्न क्षेत्रमा सहयोग र समर्थन गर्दै आएको छ नेपालमा यूएसएआईडी को प्रमुख प्राथमिकताहरू मध्ये एक गरीबी न्यूनीकरण र आर्थिक वृद्धिलाई बढावा दिनु हो एजेन्सीले रोजगारी सृजना गर्न र साना व्यवसायको लागि ऋण र वित्तीय सेवाहरूमा पहुँच बढाउन साथै कृषि उत्पादकत्व सुधार गर्न र ग्रामीण विकासलाई समर्थन गर्न काम गर्दछ यूएसएआईडी ले नेपालमा मातृ तथा बाल स्वास्थ्य परिवार नियोजन र प्रजनन स्वास्थ्य सेवाहरू र एचआईभी एड्स र क्षयरोग जस्ता संक्रामक रोगहरूको रोकथाम र उपचारका लागि सहयोग सहित स्वास्थ्य सहायता पनि उपलब्ध गराउँछ यी मुख्य क्षेत्रहरूका अतिरिक्त यूएसएआईडी ले विपद जोखिम न्यूनीकरण र प्रतिकार्य सहायता साथै मानव अधिकार सुशासन र द्वन्द रोकथाम तथा समाधानका लागि सहयोग गर्दछ नेपालमा यूएसएआईडी का कार्यक्रमहरू देशलाई दिगो समावेशी आर्थिक वृद्धि हासिल गर्न र नेपाली जनता को जीवनमा सुधार गर्न मद्दत पुर्‍याउने उद्देश्यले संचालन गरिएको हो एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर समान्त पार वेलकम टु द ब्रावो डेल्टा शो ग्रेट टु बी हियर इट्स अ भेरी इन्ट्रेस्टिङ आइरनी दैट यु वर अ जर्नलिस्ट वन्स right so what how was the transition possible or uh, the transition uh, you chose to become an administrator or, or taking up a government job so how was your transition from a journalist to a state position well i think that being a journalist um certainly instilled in me a belief that the media have a responsibility to hold public officials accountable. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in going into government, luckily I haven't yet lost that sense that you can ask any hard question of me, it's your Mm -hmm. job, and my job is to to try to be as, um, you know, candid and and, uh, as I I can be. But um, it was pretty interesting, to be honest, because having been a journalist on the outside, Mm -hmm with my face pressed up against the glass. Suddenly I was in the room, in the situation room that I'd seen in the movies and with first President Obama and now President Biden um, as, you know, some very important decisions were being made and I had a chance to bring some of the questions I had about American foreign policy, some of my own agenda uh, into the U.S. government. So I I haven't changed very much from Mm -hmm. when I was initially a war correspondent in the former Yugoslavia, and then writing about human rights issues and American foreign policy as a long form magazine journalist. Um, But the things I care about, cared about when I was a journalist, I now care about from inside the government and have the chance at USA to have this kind of toolbox Mm -hmm. to be able to support independent journalism, to support media literacy in an age of misinformation, but then also to support education for girls and you know, strengthening the health sector and mm-hmm. building the rule of law. And but so I was just curious uh, whether it at times irritates you if your former 
fraternity ask you a terrible, terrible question? Not, not really. I, mean, I really do think it's, I, I know that sounds kind of, um, that has to be fake, right? It, of course it bothers me. I mean, do I prefer easy questions to hard questions? I think so. I think most people do. But, um, but I, I really have been on that side uh, of the table. And I think I remember what it was like, you know, wanting to, to reach over the table and say, give me a straight answer, Samantha. Go, you know, come on uh, uh, on the other side. So I, I try to be very direct. Mm -hmm. And when I don't know the answer to something, uh, I try to find out the answer. I also think being a journalist and having had to write in a manner where I was trying to make big international issues and crises matter to the American people, to my American readers, mm -hmm. is actually good practice for being in government because government officials sometimes aren't that good at telling stories, mm -hmm. at, at making meaning out of the kinds of things they're trying to do in the world. And so having been a professional question asker, uh, truth extractor and storyteller, I feel like those are actually you know, pretty good skills to have when I go to the U.S. Congress. Which is a better to, job? A better job? I, I like being in government and having the ability to answer journalist questions, but also um, to deal with pandemics and climate change and, and the range of issues that if I was still a journalist, I would be writing about, complaining about, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't feel that same connection to be able to, to, to do something specific about them. So heading an aid agency from the United States. Uh, we grew up looking at the US aid logo ever since we were children. There's so many projects of cooperation we grew up with. But th these days, whenever aid is the catalyst or, or, or a talking point, people started questioning its integrity and say, strings attached. Yeah, I, I'm struck here in Nepal, um, given the length of the partnership and the friendship, that those questions are asked a lot. And, you know, I think it is because of, uh, you know, the broader geopolitical backdrop um, that every citizen of the world, you know, has to live with uh, mm -hmm. day in, day out. So I think people think that, oh, well, maybe USAID is there you know, out of some geopolitical, uh, for some geopolitical reason, or that if they provide grant assistance, that they're going to demand that we do something in return, maybe we get access to natural resources or some kind of, um, you know, uh, profit or some kind of uh, tithe, uh, that a payment that will come back to us in future years. That's just not how USAID's development model works today or has ever worked. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I really, I, I think that those Nepalis who have experienced USAID programming and partnership can attest that, you know, we don't come back and say, okay, can we now, you know, take something out of the land and bring it back to America with us, right? Mm -hmm. Or we don't say, hey, would you go on TV and praise us? And in fact, it makes me very uncomfortable when people publicly express gratitude because, you know, this is, which is very nice, of course, of them to do, but this is, this is a partnership. This is, we do believe it's in our broader interest as a country for Nepal to be a, a, a stable and peaceful democracy, for its economy to be flourishing, for... Mm -hmm it's people to be able to remain home and, and work in the country they love rather than to migrate. It's but in our- in the long run, does, does aid demand strategic partnership? There's no evidence of that in the way USAID uh, operates. I mean, a country like Nepal um, absolutely is gonna make choices for itself uh, about how it interacts with its neighbors it has some very powerful neighbors, um, extraordinarily powerful mm -hmm. uh, neighbors. And, you know, those are sovereign decisions. We will come and have a view, uh, for example, on a rule of law reform or on a new seed technology uh, as USAID or on the importance of educating girls. 
but fundamentally it's for Nepalese communities, Nepalese leaders, the voters who choose those leaders to make those decisions uh, for themselves, including how they interact uh, with their very powerful neighbors. The developed world vouched their aid vis-a-vis -vis cut out of their GDP and the cut was 0.7%, right? That's, that's the aspiration in the OECD. Mm -hmm. And vis-a-vis -vis the US aid, Nepal receives in a five-year span around $585 million. Something along that magnitude. Those and there are there. other donors who vouch their contribution in the development of Nepal. So is there a concept of clubbing such, you know, aid money that comes into a developing country like Nepal and stop duplication or, you know, uh, the right kind of development Nepal requires? I mean, I think that one area where donors definitely can improve is on coordination. Uh, my own view is if, if, for example, in Nepal, the Nepali people are in the lead, the coordination should occur at that level. In mm -hmm. other words, if, for example, the Nepali Ministry of Finance has a plan for streamlining procurement or financial management, it should have visibility into what each of the donors are doing. Nothing. There should be no shady backroom deals. You know, we are very open through our development agreement with a country about what we plan to do. In fact, with the new government, one of my main asks uh, on this visit was to say, can we sit down? Can we do a portfolio review mm -hmm. and make sure that what we're doing still aligns with your reform agenda as you now understand it? So that coordination, I think if, if we actually had locally led development, mm -hmm. if, if more power was actually invested in community leaders, local actors, uh, government reformers, government officials, that coordination uh, should, be, should be facilitated. Back in the day, as a kid in school, I remember waking up to the solitary tune of a distant bagpipe. Across the span of my youth, little did I know that this connection would grow into one that would last a lifetime. Over the years, as I matured with the wisdom of experience, I realized that this wistful tune was not only woven deep into the spirit of the highlands from whence it sprung, but reached out to me and curiously connected my sense of being to our very own highlands here at home. As the magical warmth of the highlands is now recreated in the Himalayas, the patterned art comes alive and thrives with a tremendous sense of color and texture. Gorkha Tweed, the Himalayan answer to the Highland heritage. I think if, if we actually had locally led development, mm -hmm. if, if more power was actually invested in community leaders, local actors, uh, government reformers, government officials, that coordination uh, should, be, should be facilitated. Um, I think among uh, developed advanced democracies who have been doing assistance for some time, there is, of course, coordination at the country level I'm actually going from this interview to meet with the European Union Commissioner mm -hmm. um, uh, to talk a little bit about what the European Union is doing here in Nepal. So again, we, I think we, we do coordinate, but as the United States, for example, moves into substantial infrastructure partnerships, mm -hmm. 
particularly disaster resilient infrastructure, which we know um, uh, Nepal uh, has a great need for. Um, I think it is President Biden's view that if we could channel uh, resources collectively, we would be able to make uh, collectively major inroads in the infrastructure development priorities of countries like Nepal. And I, I mention that because um, you know, I think there are a lot of development finance institutions that mm -hmm. are um, have been doing their own thing. For example, during the the uh, previous administration before President Biden came in, and he has really placed a priority on let us identify the problem set, the challenge set. Let us hear what our partners uh, in the real world wish to do, and let us as democracies and as donors come together and as investors come together and figure out how collectively we mobilize resources. Because we do have something in common. We believe in environmental safeguards. Mm -hmm. We believe that we do not uh, want countries to, to get themselves into trouble by taking on too much debt mm -hmm. in order to build the infrastructure. We want the infrastructure uh, and, and where it is placed and, and those kinds of choices to benefit from the input of civil society, mm -hmm. from indigenous communities. Um, and so there's a set of standards that I think a, a community of democracies can bring and also additional resources. And so we are trying to do more of that coordination, I think, than, than has been done in the past. Are you aware of how a development need in Nepal germinates and reaches you for assistance? And are you happy with how it's germinated? Well, I think it's a combination and I'm not a person who's living in Nepal, you know, having these mm -hmm. conversations day to day. But uh, one of the things that maybe not everybody knows is that um, more than two thirds of USAID's overseas workforce mm -hmm. um, is consists of nationals of the countries in which we work. Mm -hmm. So more than two thirds, in fact, uh, of our USAID staff in Nepal uh, are Nepalis. They mm -hmm. are people that come from all over the country, from different communities, different backgrounds. I think we can be even more inclusive, actually, as we hire uh, our Nepali staff. But so they are not strangers uh, to the communities in which we are working. Mm -hmm. Many of the people who work at, at, at USAID, who are nationals of the countries in which we work, have worked with us for you know more than 10 years, 20 years. And, and today I met our longest serving staff member who's worked for USAID for 33 years. You can imagine, you know, how many uh, schools uh, that he has uh, contributed to seeing built. You know, how many seeds have been dispersed to farmers. How many uh, young people he has met who have talked about their tech needs in in in, in schools. Um, so we rely a lot on our so-called foreign service nationals, nationals mm -hmm. of the countries in which we work. Uh, that is not true for all embassies or for all uh, development agencies, but it is. USAID's comparative advantage, for sure. It is what you know allows mm -hmm. us to have that connective tissue. Then I think the you know some of our programming, uh, a minority, uh, a small a small amount of our programming is done directly to governments. Um, that used to be much much bigger uh, decades mm -hmm. ago, uh, but because of uh, corruption concerns in many countries, our U.S. Congress. Uh, urged us to move away from that and move through independent partners. Mm -hmm. The downside of that approach is that you can work through partners who might come from the United States or come from some other country and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And so the development uh, impacts are less likely to be sustained. So now we are shifting to ensure that 100% of what USA does, uh, that the design of what we do is done by our local partners, whether in government or in civil society mm -hmm. or in the private sector, and that 40% of those that we fund are that that those funds go directly uh, to local partners. And I know 40% doesn't sound like a large mm -hmm. amount, but actually, because of all the requirements around doing work with USAID contracts and lawyers and accountants. Um, the, the percentage of assistance that USAID gives to local partners is, uh, is under 10% globally. Mm -hmm. And so actually Nepal is a trailblazer in moving very, very quickly to get to, to that number by 2025 to be 40%.
but also for 100% of our programming to be designed mm -hmm. at its core uh, by the, the Nepalese. So in terms of then how the proposal comes together, usually we have some sense of what the identified needs are. You know, is the agricultural sector a key reform area? Is that what a country is trying to grow? Or are they trying to diversify their economy and become a major IT powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that inform, mm -hmm. you know, whether we want to spend those additional resources that we might get from Congress on IT or on uh, mm -hmm. seed and, and fertilizer programming, you know, that comes from a dialogue. How do we fear in the accountability and transparency of utilizing aid money? Well, I think we've made some progress at the municipal level. Um, where now uh, all of the municipal governments through a program with USAID have um, put their expenditures on the same public financial management system. Mm -hmm. So there's much more accountability and transparency in that. Uh, that's important as a donor, but it's especially important if you're a Nepali citizen mm -hmm. because you want to know where your taxpayer resources are being spent. I mean, ultimately, it's going to be domestic resource mobilization, taxation, that is how, uh, you know, uh, Nepali government spending uh, gets done. And that's, of course, still the uh, a, a huge infusion of funds comes from, mm -hmm. from taxpayers here in this country. So I think we're chipping away at that challenge. It's one of the things I talked to the prime minister about today. Mm -hmm. we're, we've just launched a new $20 million public financial management program that mm -hmm. I think will allow us to expand that. Um, but, you know, we, we, th we, despite having a very significant uh, uh, budget uh, in Nepal, um, we only, uh, again, a sm relatively small share of that budget goes through the government. Um, what we are trying to do is strengthen the capacity of local organizations and make sure that they too are uh, accountable because when we answer to our taxpayers, we have to give assurances that there has been no mm -hmm. waste and no abuse and, and no corruption. If if corruption happens and tech, U.S. taxpayer resources are spent in improper ways, that makes it harder for us to go back and ask for more resources. So we're very careful about that. But that's one reason, um, again, that um, that we've, we've been risk averse mm -hmm. and thus have tended to work through international intermediaries in many of our programs um, where local actors receive the resources, but often there's some middlemen. And now we are trying to absorb a little more risk because we recognize that that it will be the development outcomes that we secure will be much more sustainable if it is the local mm -hmm. Nepali partner, even with a little more risk and, and maybe not the same number of accountants, you mm -hmm. know, working for the NGO or for the, the government ministry. Nonetheless, that is where the enduring Mm -hmm. you know, sustainable uh, development outcome is more likely. You, you mentioned a significant budget uh, for Nepal. And with your visit, should Nepal expect that budget to enlarge in the future? Well, not just with my visit. One of the things that I did when I came in um, to my role, uh, which was uh, almost two years ago, was to look around the world and say, OK, democracy is on its back heel globally. No question. Mm -hmm. We've seen indicators for human rights going down in many, many parts of the world. Where are they going up? Where are things improving? And Nepal was one of the countries that we saw some real reform uh, possibility. So one of the things that I did was I organized my, my team at USAID from, from headquarters. You know, our mission here was already doing its great work. Um, taking its cue uh, from, from our Nepali partners. But I said from headquarters, let's pay special attention to a handful of countries that are trying to strengthen the rule of law, fight corruption, and um, be more inclusive. Are we doing enough? Well, I mean, you, you at least are, uh, the, the trend lines are heading here in a better direction than they are globally. Um, and with the new government, we think there's a, a really important opportunity, particularly to cut the red tape and the bureaucracy and get rid of some of the regulatory impediments that have scared off the private sector. Because 
the new mode of development isn't one of assistance, you know, grant here, project there. The, the mode of development that we seek is one where Nepal's economy is fully self-sufficient, that, that you don't need any relationship. Just a curiosity, to our country. are we just climbing the ladder because we are geopolitically very strategically placed in the world? Well, that or, wouldn't, that wouldn't, there are plenty of geopolitically uh, well-placed countries that haven't seen an increase in U.S. aid assistance because resources are so stretched after the pandemic and after Putin's invasion of Ukraine and with climate change, we don't have a lot of surplus. So uh, President Biden has instructed me to look for places where there is a political will uh, to push a reform agenda because one of the lessons of all the democratic backsliding that has occurred even in established democracies like the United States is that one reason that, that democracy is slipping in many places is there has not been a sense among many citizens that democracy delivers economically. Mm -hmm. And so my objective as USAID administrator is if we see an opening, a bright spot here or a bright spot there at the municipal level or in some part of Nepal or at the national level uh, is to be in a position to say, okay, let us work with you. You continue this set of political reforms, electoral reforms, anti-corruption reforms, and we will work with you to try to bring more private sector investment. Back in the day, as a kid in school, I remember waking up to the solitary tune of a distant bagpipe. Across the span of my youth, Little did I know that this connection would grow into one that would last a lifetime. Over the years, as I matured with the wisdom of experience, I realized that this wistful tune was not only woven deep into the spirit of the Highlands from whence it sprung, but reached out to me and curiously connected my sense of being to our very own highlands here at home. As the magical warmth of the highlands is now recreated in the Himalayas, the patterned art comes alive and thrives with a tremendous sense of color and texture. Gorkha Tweed the Himalayan answer to the Highland heritage. You know, I, I brought Nepal to a meeting that I and Secretary Blinken chaired in New York at the mm -hmm. UN General Assembly. Nepal was only one of a handful of countries that we invited because of the reforms that have been committed at the Summit for Democracy and, and elsewhere. And we brought some of the leading CEOs from the United States to come together uh, with heads of state and foreign ministers, in the case of Nepal, to speak about the reform agendas so that the business leaders could hear that something interesting is happening in Nepal and that they, maybe they're in the, in the uh, tourist sector. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to make an investment here and, you know, help uh, expand some of the infrastructure that exists for tourists, where you could expand the number of tourists mm -hmm. now that the pandemic has ended. Maybe uh, agro producers, big agro businesses, want to invest in seed manufacturing mm -hmm. here in Nepal. Well, on the ground here, our mission wants to work with the government to make that easier for businesses. But out in the world, my job is to jump up and down and say, hey, give Nepal a chance, look and see, because I recognize that Democratic change that does not come with development progress, economic progress, that democratic change is often very fleeting. Mm -hmm. And we want the democratic model to survive. We believe it is better for economic results in the long term. But we also know that a lot of people are not trusting their leaders these days. There's a lot of misinformation. There are, uh, of course, forces in the world that 
don't much care whether government leaders are accountable to their citizens or not. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're trying to create some different model, but they may be just indifferent to that. We believe that civil society and that the full spectrum of people in Nepal, um, you know, if they have a voice in the democratic process, that is going to mean better outcomes, better economic opportunity, more growth, more mm -hmm. job opportunities for young people. So we have a theory of change and a theory of democratic accountability, but we know that democracy without economic development, you know, that 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 really hasn't uh, produced the kind of. When results. we talk about democracy, economic development, and the private sector, is USAID open partner with Nepalese private sector? A hundred percent. In fact, I've just created a new private sector fund called the Edge Fund where we've issued an appeal to the private sector all around the world to say, if you need us, for example, to de-risk an investment because you're a little skittish about, about how that investment is going to go or whether it's a reliable market, for example, you know, maybe there's some outside investor who's thinking about you know, building mountain bike trails you know, in the hills mm. of Nepal or uh, you know, expanding uh, some uh, spiritual retreat uh, uh, tourism of that nature and USAID can help by bearing first loss or mm -hmm. by offering a loan guarantee. We are absolutely open to those kinds of partnerships. USAID is also the vice chair of the board of something called the Development Finance Corporation. And the Development Finance Corporation has already come in under President Biden and now offered $160 million worth of loans and loan guarantees and credits mm -hmm. to small and medium sized enterprises here. And uh, how would the private sector qualify to actually? Well, I think the devil is in the details about which sector we mm -hmm. are talking to, but that is precisely why we have a USAID mission here in Nepal that is, you know, putting up the shingle and saying we are open for partnership. You know, we know that it will be uh, Nepali business people, bankers, social entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs who have the ideas mm -hmm. about which businesses, which sectors can flourish. But we have a lot of connections externally that maybe some of those private sector actors here would benefit from. And mm -hmm. so that brokering is something we're very open to. That's the new model of development. Because mm -hmm. remember, our objective is trade, not aid. It's for Nepal's economy to be independent, not for you to you know, take loans or incur debt, for us to give you grants that are catalytic, mm -hmm. for us to potentially, again, offer a loan guarantee where we bear the loss in the interest of trying to encourage private sector growth here for the Nepali people. And before we part, uh, we both, you were a media person and I'm still pursuing my career out of it. We are from the old school that the press existed and there were formal media houses and media companies that ran the news business. Yeah. But these days with the advent of social media and its use and misuse in many spheres have actually made a very big impact in the growth of the world. So how do you look at it uh, from your placement that is the social media uprising helping the dissemination of right kind of information about development and foreign relations? Well, I have to believe that the social media and the absence of any referees or any truth standards um, is contributing to this string of questions I've been getting on my visit about what's in it for USAID, you know, this kind of uh, skepticism that we could actually uh, be here simply because we care about Nepal's economic trajectory and about young people in Nepal having opportunity. People, people are very suspicious that mm -hmm. that can possibly be true, but it's been true for 75 years and for more than six decades with USAID uh, as such. Uh, and yet still, I think because of some of the things that people read on social media or just in general, a new, uh, relatively recent um, skepticism about, about truth and maybe even about the possibility of an organic partnership, um, we hear more and more questions of that nature. So I think that's one example of falsehoods and misinformation 
really obscuring a fundamental truth, mm -hmm. which actually I think a lot of Nepali people really know because they've seen the schools, they've seen the roads, they've seen the infant mortality rates, uh, you know, cut in half. They, they, they know the USA logo, like you mm -hmm. said. They've worked in a USA program or seen one from afar or seen a teacher trained. So they know deep down, but then they see on social media something that casts a doubt on that. So, you know, I think that's irresponsible for people to be uh, spreading lies. It's, it's meant to sow division and to sow suspicion. And it's something we will never do. We, we, uh, we will talk about our development objectives. We will talk in a factual way about uh, what we are seeking to achieve. Uh, we will be transparent about our programming. You can look on our website. You can see what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, if you have questions, you know, we have a, a, a Nepali staff that can speak in uh, local language in order to, to, to answer those questions. We are accountable to the media. Um, but we're not going to uh, go tit for tat in terms of spreading misinformation. Mm -hmm. We are going to tell our own story, which we think is a very compelling story. I think there is an issue more broadly about democracy and how it is struggling to know how to manage all of this misinformation. I mean, mm -hmm. we in the United States, an established democracy that has had democratic institutions in place for, you know, several hundred years, had an insurrection mm. where the capital of uh, our country was overtaken by an armed riot mm. on the basis of misinformation, on the basis of the so-called big lie about uh, election theft that never happened. So we know firsthand how fragile democracy is and how misinformation can run rampant, even when you in public life correct the record and explain you know, what the facts are. When somebody is in an echo chamber and only hearing lies you know, uh, ricocheting backwards and forwards, one can become also much more extreme. Mm -hmm. So I think all of us have a lot to learn, uh, those of us who are privileged to work in public institutions about how to fight misinformation. I think this is an example of where USAID needs to do more programming, uh, not about what's true and what's false, but about empowering young people uh, to be media literate in mm -hmm. this new environment. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you and I were kids, we grew up learning to believe what was in our textbooks. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought it was in our textbooks, that's true. Well, young people today, often they look at their phones and they think if it's mm -hmm. on their phone, it must be true. And so how can teachers play a role as well, starting at a very young age in helping uh, develop critical thinking so that uh, young people challenge uh, what they see, or at least ask questions about it, but also so they don't give up on truth altogether, because mm -hmm. we don't want uh, nihilism, we don't want people to give up on the idea that there is right and wrong, that there is true and false. I mean, what would that mean? So we think also the investments that we make in independent media are very important, that those who still fact check, mm -hmm. uh, those who still are, if they make a mistake, because mistakes happen, of course, even with the best of intentions, that they still issue corrections. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we still believe that that kind of uh, journalism is not only as vital, but arguably more vital mm -hmm. in today's age of, of misinformation and falsehood. Administrator Samantha, thank you very much for your time and thoughts. And so we like to request you to take back greetings to the government and the people of the United States from Nepal. Thank you very much. For thank you. And thank you for the work you do every day. Thank you.